I'd like to now welcome our second speaker to the stage. Dr. Pamina Furchow is an assistant professor of conflict analysis and resolution at George Mason University. Her research interests include political violence, transitional justice, especially victim reparations, reconciliation, and peace building. In particular, she is very interested in the study of international accompaniment of local communities affected by mass violence. Her specific focus is on the role of concept formation in the measurement and evaluation of external interventions and how local people can be included in these processes. Please help me welcome to the stage Dr. Pamina Furchow. and I'm a professor at George Mason University um, and I'm actually also a former senior Jennings Randolph fellow here at USIP so it's, it's really wonderful to be back. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about a project that I've been leading for about six years called the Everyday Peace Indicators Project and uh, this approach was developed by myself and uh, my colleague Roger McGinty from Durham University now uh, in the UK in order to address our concerns about measurement validity and concept formation uh, in traditional approaches to measuring a difficult to define concepts, such as reconciliation, governance, peace, justice, and violent extremism. Uh, the usual way to measure these kinds of concepts <clears throat> is to start with experts or scholars, <clears throat> or in the cases of evaluation, which some of you may be more familiar with, um, program managers, uh, usually sitting in Washington, D.C., um, or London, or Capital City, um, far away from the communities where uh, the research is carried out, or the evaluation is carried out. Uh, many of you may be uh, doing that yourselves um, and very familiar with that process. So um, just to run through the process, experts come up with um, their own definitions uh, for these difficult to define concepts like peace or violent extremism in this case, usually based on broad theories that are meant to be applied in many different contexts around the world. And they use this theoretical definition to develop different signs or indicators to measure whether there is more or less peace or whatever social phenomenon they're, they're studying, so violent extremism for example, in the places that they're studying. Um, they might use these indicators to develop a survey or then come up later with focus group questions or, an inter or interview questions. Uh, these ways of measuring difficult to define concepts typically don't change from one country or another um, or from a region to another, definitely not from a village to another. Uh, for example, a survey in Colombia uh, would ask the same questions in most cases in Bogota as it would in, in Cartagena. Um, so why is this problematic? Well, outsiders may not fully capture the concept in the way that it is being lived or understood on the ground. Um, therefore, leading to concerns about measurement validity or whether or not that tool is, is valid. Uh, they might not fully capture what the concept means at the community level, um, so at the village level or at the neighborhood level, or reflect how the people on the ground understand it. Outside experts um, will have difficulty framing questions and indicators in a language that can be locally understood, um, so extra processes need to be taken in order for people to understand what they're talking about. So communities really are best placed to identify their own indicators of the social phenomena they experience since they're already doing this in their everyday lives. Um, in other words, people are already using uh, their own indi everyday indicators to determine whether or not they are at peace or reconciled or there's more or less violent extremism, for example. Um, so why not gather those indicators and analyze them um, for policy use? So instead of uh, letting experts decide what these concepts mean in different parts of the world, the everyday indicators approach starts off by asking people at the village level or the neighborhood level um, how they define them. And then it uses their answers to come up with locally specific ways of defining and measuring these concepts. Um, this process is also useful for planning and evaluation purposes of peace building related work. Uh, 
the process uh, that we've developed involves four key steps. First, we develop the indicators through a series of focus groups by asking people what signs they look to in their daily lives to determine whether they and their communities are at peace. So um, speaking to individuals about in, in focus group um, environments to really get the tangible signs. What are those signs that they use in their daily lives to determine whether they are more or less at peace or whether there is more or less violent extremism, for example. Um, these indicators are highly localized and contextual. Uh, here are some examples of indicators from past uh, studies. So for example, in Atiak, Uganda, um, can the Boda Boda cyclist ride to certain areas? Uh, as you can see, it's very context specific, um, very almost anecdotal in some cases, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's a local experience. Um, and this one, when you dig a little bit deeper, um, you can see that it has more um, layers to it because Boda Boda cyclists who in, in northern Uganda are the taxi drivers, right? Um, they uh, are um, often ex-combatants and so they're plugged into post-conflict networks and clearly it makes sense that people are looking to them to decide where they can go and where they can't go, right? Um, and um, you know, we've, we've done this study in other places as well. Um, in Afghanistan with USIP, we uh, did a study on violent extremism indicators where, um, I mean, the lists and lists of indicators, but um, an interesting one that I saw was, um, and sort of related to radio, was uh, um, uh, TV antennas. Um, whether or not there were TV antennas in a village um, allowed people to have a better idea of where, where, if there were a lot of TV antennas in, in a village, allowed people to um, understand if there was more or less violent extremism in that, in that particular context. So, um, <clears throat> So as you can see, very contextual. Uh, again, um, it's important to stress that what we're gathering are indicators that people are already using um, in their daily lives, um, or what we call indigenous technical knowledge. Um, so people are not inventing these indicators for us, nor are we asking people to um, you know, um, create indicators for a particular project, for example, right? We are uh, sourcing indigenous technical knowledge. Um, so these are indicators that people already use in their daily lives. And what we are doing is not creating new indicators. We are gener sourcing them and then analyzing them and using them for policy guidance. Um, and then the, uh, going back to the process, and the indicators are then verified through a participatory process that involves the community. Uh, and this ensures that the indicators are as representative as possible of the community and also narrows down the list of available indicators uh, so that we, first of all, have a manageable list of indicators, but also, you know, oftentimes in focus groups, there'll be someone who comes up with a one-off indicator. Um, but uh, this process really narrows down the indicators um, to, and also uh, it creates a list that's meaningful for the, for the community and representative of the community. <laughs> These indicators can then be analyzed and also be coded into categories in order to help with planning and design uh, of the projects. And so um, the individual indicators can be analyzed or can be used for policy guidance, but also we also code the uh, indicators into categories because there can be the problem, right, that you maybe uh, are not seeing the forest for the trees. And so in order to be able to or sorry, the trees for the forest, uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, in, in order to be able to see a little bit of a broader overview, uh, we can code them into categories. And we usually do that through process tracing of the actual indicators. Um, so we create categories that are inductive rather than deductive. Um, but usually those categories end up shaking out to be policy uh, areas of interest anyway. And um, 
Um, and so, so then we can say, for example, um, w that one area is particularly concerned with issues to do with human rights, whereas another one um, is more interested in security or is defining peace more in terms of development or whatever, um, so that uh, you can zoom out a little bit um, because sometimes it's, it is almost too localized, right? Um, <clears throat> So it's important to stress that the difference between the everyday indicators and regular indicators is that the indicators themselves can already tell us a lot about what peace means to people on the ground and, um, and therefore can be independently analyzed to guide programming. So they're, the indicators themselves are analyzable. Um, but then the indicators um, also provide the basis for questions that allow us to understand more about that concept in a community. Um, and sorry, I... There we go. Um, oh, I was pressing the wrong button. Um, so the indicators um, are, can provide the, pro the, the basis um, for surveys, um, but also for questions or existing data. Um, you can populate the questions with whatever data is um, available. Uh, where we typically um, populate them w uh, into surveys because there isn't a lot of uh, data available at the very local level. Um, and so one way is to survey the communities over time with the indicators in order to understand uh, whether they are at peace according to their own indicators um, and how that changes over time. And that's particularly also useful in evaluation. Uh, the everyday peace indicators approach is concerned with rigor, validity, and reliability, but it really also prioritizes local voices over external voices uh, in the development and evaluation of programs um, and in, in measurement in general. Uh, therefore, we consider ourselves an approach to produce participatory numbers and statistics that work with communities to produce policy guidance in a language and a format uh, that policymakers can use. So the idea being that we are um, uh, galvanizing communities to really um, help work with us uh, to produce uh, numbers, but include them in the process of creating those measurement tools, right? Where they're usually excluded in that process, they may be sources of information, but they're excluded in the process. And so we're including them into that process, recognizing that policymakers often have a need for numbers. So if you'd like to learn more about the, pro uh, about the project, um, we have a website, which you can check out, everydaypeaceindicators.org. Um, and you can also pick up my new book on Amazon, which is here. Um, and the book engages with uh, the academic debates on concept formation and makes an argument for participatory numbers uh, and the everyday peace indicators approach in particular. And it then goes on to make arguments about local level peace building effectiveness using the everyday peace indicators in a quasi experimental design in villages in Colombia and Uganda. So thank you very much.